If you go to patreon.com slash the cyberwire, you can find out how to become a contributor, and at the $10 per month level, you gain access to the ad-free version of our show. It's the same Cyberwire, just without the ads. So check it out, patreon.com slash the Cyberwire. Thanks. U.S. investigators are looking for a disgruntled former insider in the Shadow Brokers case. Operation Hack the Analyst claims to have doxed a threat intelligence analyst. Electrical utilities look to their defenses. Trickbot gets wormy. NotPetya continues to have material effect on its corporate victims' earnings. Sweden's government is shaken by its data breach. ISIS loses brick-and-mortar presence but may be moving online. Ransomware's lethality to small businesses may be exaggerated. And how do you fund a nuclear program? From Pyongyang, Texas Hold'em looks like a good bet. Time for some notes from our sponsor, Silence. We've been following WannaCry, Petya, not Petya, and other forms of destructive ransomware for weeks. Silence would like you to know that they can prevent Petya-like ransomware from executing in your system, and they'd also like you to know that they've been doing that since October of 2015. How's that for getting ahead of the threat? Their success against not Petya demonstrates the benefit of their temporal predictive advantage. Silence Protect stops both file and fileless malware. It runs silently in the background. And best of all, it doesn't suffer from the blind spots in legacy defenses that NotPetya exploited to such devastating effect. If you don't have Silence Protect and you'd like to learn more about how it can defend your enterprise, head on over to Silence.com and find out how their AI-driven solution can predict and prevent the unknown unknowns from troubling you. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Monday, July 31st, 2017. Speculation about the shadow brokers increasingly turns toward the possibility that their source is a disgruntled alumnus or alumna of NSA. CyberScoop says it's been talking with multiple people familiar with the matter, who say the investigation is focusing on former employees who had access and an axe to grind. Two of their unnamed sources tell them, the publication says, that the incident goes far beyond the Hal Martin case, in which a contract worker at NSA allegedly removed a very large quantity of highly classified information. An insider seems in many ways likely to be involved. The possibility that the stolen information the brokers have been hawking came from an NSA attack server left inadvertently exposed was entertained soon after the hacking group began dumping material last summer, but that has come to strike many as less likely. Among the classified material leaked are found, for example, PowerPoint presentations, not in most observers' view the sort of thing one would find on a staging server. So an insider feeding a state actor seems likely. At Black Hat last week, the shadow brokers were given a pony award. The ponies always credit an individual or group for a real or a dubious achievement. The credit line on the shadow broker's prize was the Russians, straight up, the Russians. Another apparent hack, this one on an individual legitimate security analyst, came to light earlier today. A Mandiant analyst's personal accounts were seemingly breached, with doxing carried out on pastebin by a person or persons calling themselves the 31337 hackers. The doxing was, they say, part of Operation Leak the Analyst. They also claim to have breached Mandiant systems sometime in 2016, but there are no documents posted so far that suggest this is anything beyond extravagant boasting. Mandiant is a unit of FireEye, and FireEye says it's found no evidence that any of its systems or networks were compromised. But of course, an investigation is in progress. As far as declared motivation, the 31337 hackers say they've long resented legitimate security analysts and have decided to target them as individuals. The communiques that accompanied their pace bin doxing aren't quite written in shadow brokerese, but there are some similarities. One of the shadow brokers' linguistic stigmata is a mangled plural, as in their use of peoples. There are signs of this in what the 31337 hackers have to say. For example, this document describes some of the key events of the past two months related to cyber espionage. Not quite as mannered and contrived as the shadow brokers. Indeed, it's within the range of what one might see in an undergraduate's term paper. But still, Operation Leak the Analyst will bear watching. 
Researchers have offered electrical utilities advice on how to discern early signs of cyber attacks similar to those that have afflicted Ukraine. Dragos and others warn that the malware employed is readily adaptable to grid targets anywhere. Such targets need not be older forms of power generation and distribution. Wind farms, for example, are also susceptible to attack. WannaCry and NotPetya owed some of their wildfire spread to their worm-like functionality. Flashpoint researchers warn that the venerable banking malware TrickBot, venerable in malware terms, it's been around for more than a year, has adopted some similar techniques to enable its own dissemination. It's now being found in a much wider geographical region. Some U.S. banks have seen incursions, which is relatively new. The effects of NotPetya continue to be felt. At the end of last week, pharmaceutical company Merck disclosed that its manufacturing had been disrupted and has yet to fully recover. Merck warns that the attack can be expected to have material effects on the company's performance. It can be expected that more companies will warn over the coming month. Sweden's large government data breach has resulted in two more departures from that country's cabinet. The ministers responsible for home affairs and infrastructure have both left the government. The breach involved Sweden's transportation agency. It began in 2012, was detected in 2016, and is not expected to be fully remediated for some months yet. The cause of the data exposure is being put down to improper supervision of a $100 million deal with IBM to handle driver's licensing and vehicle registration. The agency failed, apparently, to control what data it handed over and how the data was controlled. The Swedish prime minister called the breach of information a total breakdown, saying, It is incredibly serious. It is a violation of the law and puts Sweden and its citizens in harm's way. The head of their security service said, This is very serious because it could damage our operational business that we are conducting every day in order to protect Sweden. Sweden's transportation agency handles data such as the weight capacities of roads and bridges, potentially useful to an invader, and the type, model, weight, operations, and condition of government and military vehicles, from which, among other things, order of battle could be inferred. There was also much private information at risk, including the names, photos, and home addresses of Air Force pilots, anyone in police registers, people in witness relocation programs, and members of the Swedish Special Operations Forces. ISIS has lost most of its core territory. Observers expect that the terrorist group will make some attempt to reconstitute its claims to being a renewed caliphate through its online presence. Small businesses can be hit hard by ransomware, but NextGov reports that the widely quoted statistic that 60% of the businesses so hit go under within six months is exaggerated. The publication says it's working to run the stat to ground, but that it's symptomatic of the shaky information that circulates in the cyber sector. Finally, you may have heard that North Korea not only tested an ICBM at the end of last week, but that it's got an aggressive nuclear weapons program, too. How does Pyongyang finance that program? In significant part through cybercrime. A particular favorite of DPRK hackers appears to be online poker. Now another message about some research from our sponsor, Silence. You know, good policy is informed by sound technical understanding. The crypto wars aren't over. Silence would like to share some thoughts from ICIT on the surveillance state and censorship and about the conundrum of censorship legislation. They've concluded that recent efforts by governments to weaken encryption, introduce exploitable vulnerabilities into applications, and develop nation-state dragnet surveillance programs will do little to stymie the rise in terrorist attacks. These efforts will be a detriment to national security and only further exhaust law enforcement resources and obfuscate adversary communiques within a massive cloud of noise. Back doors for the good guys mean back doors for the bad guys, and it's next to impossible to keep the lone wolves from hearing the howling of the pack. Go to Silance.com and take a look at their blog for reflections on surveillance, censorship, and security. That's Silance.com. And we thank Silance for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to welcome back Malek Ben Salem. She's the R&D manager for security at Accenture Labs. Malek, welcome back. Today we wanted to talk about some interesting stuff that you've all been up to at Accenture with uh, global ID systems for refugees. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so Accenture announced uh, last month at the uh, ID2020 conference, and ID2020 is a uh, global public-private partnership dedicated to solving the challenges of identity fo- faced by billions of people around the world. But at that ID2020 conference, Accenture announced a new uh, global ID system for refugees uh, that is built on blockchain technology. The choice for blockchain technology is obviously it's because it's distributed and therefore available most of the time. But it also has some capabilities that allow the um, data owner to have control over what records get shared with whom. And we know that refugees face significant problems because they lose their proof of existence, their proof of identity in zones of war and crisis. And so they need a way to establish that identity in order to get services such as education and, you know, healthcare services provided by the UN or uh, by other organizations. This new technology, this new global system should be able uh, to help them uh, establish their identity as they cross borders. And so take me through from a practical point of view, how exactly does it work? Let's say I'm a, I'm a refugee, how are you going to establish an ID for me? So you would sign up with your biometric data. It could be your fingerprint or your iris scan or uh, some biometric data to uh, establish that identity, but also organizations that have uh, access to your records, let's say the school you went to, which has access to your diploma, would sign up to the same system and would share that data to verify that you have that record. Right. So the data would stay off blockchain, but the verification happens through the blockchain. So is it, is it a situation where uh, through various types of data, um, the, the strength of the certainty of that ID gets uh, improved over time? Yes, as more additional pieces of information get gathered, but also it's the scale as more people get signed up to this tool, then it can be not just offered for uh, refugees. At this point, we're offering it for refugees, but it could be a way of offering this to everybody, right? It's a way of having a digital identity where you keep all of your records in one place and you don't lose them for any reason. We're seeing more instances of this, for example, through the Swiss town that is known as the Crypto Valley of Switzerland. Um, has announced that it will provide all of its citizens with a digital identity on the Ethereum blockchain by September 2017. So I think we're going to see more of this trend in the near future. All right. Interesting stuff. Malek Ben Salem, thanks for joining us. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, along with interviews, our glossary, and more, visit thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make The Cyberwire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out more about Silence and how they can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit silence.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I have a regular segment called Security Ha. It's a good time. We hope you'll enjoy it. And also, don't forget to check out the Recorded Future podcast. I'm the host there as well. The subject is threat intelligence. The Cyberwire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>